were told that you had a serious, life-threatening disease, wouldn't you want to be told how to treat it as soon as possible? And wouldn't you want to get the help of the best specialist that you could find? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, Dr. J. Vernon McGee helps us see how the Word of God reveals our spiritual disease, followed by how to get help curing it. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, so as you find your place, Greg and I want to catch you up on some new things that God is doing through our partnership together. Yeah, Steve, I'm just so thankful to everybody that prays for and those that are able to financially support through the Bible. Uh, I I just wish you could sit next to me at my Mm -hmm. email box and see every week new kinds of things are flowing in and new reports from around the world. So we just want to take a few minutes to give a taste of how dynamic this ministry is and the way God leads us. So the first thing I want to share is about a very tough part of the world, and that's Malaysia, which if you're looking at a map, it's just north of Singapore. It's a peninsular country, and it's mostly Muslim, very, very hard place to bring the gospel to. And we have launched a social media team uh, that is trying to reach people with a shorter version of Dr. McGee's teaching because people online often you know, will only engage with shorter content. Right, a 20 five or 28 minute program is not going to not going to fly on social media, at least initially. Right, right. And the idea, of course, is we introduce them to say five minutes or four minutes of Dr. McGee's teaching in the Malay language, and then they get interested and then we can give them more. Yeah. The thing I really love about this, really from my business experience of running a franchise, you standardize in one area. And then if you find something that works, you can easily replicate it all over the place. Yes. That's how McDonald's got started. Yes. And that's what we're doing with all of these different little experiences experiments and starts is when something's successful in one area, we're getting better at sharing that information with these other language groups and people that are trying to be successful in their areas. And it's wonderful. We're seeing the fruit of that. Yeah. And and social media, we were just talking before we got yeah. uh, turned the mics on that it's a double-edged sword and there are there's some challenges and negatives, but we are using it to get the word of God to people. And speaking of that, uh, another thing that's relatively new is we just added a new social media person for Through the Bible. Bible Spanish. As you know, we, you and I talk about it all the time. The first non-English yeah. language back in 1973, we have a huge ministry. Probably it's airing on six or 700 stations in North and Latin America. I yeah. Mean, tremendous. Yeah. In the United States. So it's as well as yeah, in yeah. Mexico and, and, and so beyond. The social media needs have grown. People are responding. And so we now have a, a part-time staff member working there. Now, Uh, Another really exciting ministry uh, that we've just given approval for, and I look forward to bringing reports back in the months to come, is called Talk Pigeon for Papua New Guinea. And I think you have a a missionary you know in that area, I do. Yeah, Yeah, we have someone from our church that's uh, serving with the Inapong and Tongwat people. She's doing translation, and she is in a very hard place, and she's doing a wonderful job. And it is. It is a very interesting part of the world for missionaries to try to bring the gospel. And uh, one of the cool kind of confirmations we got, Steve, was after we had given approval, you know, we have so many great listeners in our family that are really serious missionary-hearted people. And we got an email from a former uh, Wycliffe missionary who said, you really ought to be in uh, pigeon, in uh, Melanesian pigeon. And I looked it up and it's the same, it's just another name for it in Papua New Guinea. And so that was kind of confirmation that one of our Through the Bible listening family said, you ought to be in this. So there's your update to whoever wrote that into us. We want to let you know about that. I want to give you an update that we're working on right now. As you know, in the Suriname language, there is a guy who grew up, where is Suriname? It's in uh, the northern part of Latin America. Okay, so he grew up in the northern part of Latin America. He now lives in Orange County yes. and is a manager at a Ralph store, and he wants to get back to the mission field. He's in the process of raising support, and he is working on translating through the Bible into Suriname in Orange County. Yeah, that's right. They actually, uh, and you actually sent me the the YouTube link to when they had just finished the publication of the Bible in in that language. Yeah. And they are very excited about doing this and forming home groups uh, using that home group model that we've talked about. So, yeah, Steve, and that's not even on my list. And that yeah. was another new thing. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Absolutely. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study in Mark chapter 14? Father, your word is living and active. We know you are living and active. You are constantly reaching new people. And we thank you that we get to play a small part in bringing your whole word to the whole world and seeing people's lives 
transformed for eternity. We just ask you to keep blessing the things that we're doing and that you would keep transforming lives as we get your word out in all of these languages and all of these different ways and mediums. We love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We left off last time in this very wonderful 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the longest chapter in the Gospel, and it's loaded with action because we've come now into the shadow of the cross. And we saw last time that he went to the upper room for the Last Supper. He pointed out Judas Iscariot, and I think Judas Iscariot left at this particular juncture, and then he instituted a new feast on the dying embers of a fading feast, he reared a new monument, not a monument in brass or marble, but one that takes these elements that perish so easily, bread and wine. You see, the Passover had looked forward to his coming as the Passover lamb, and now the Lord's Supper looks back to his death. The bread speaks of his body that was broken, You see, not a bone in his body was broken. And notice now as I turn here and begin reading, verse 22, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, there's several things here that are, I think, interesting and important. The Passover cup went around seven times during the Passover feast, and during that time they would sing one of these great Hallel psalms. And it was the seventh time around, which apparently he did not drink. But that's the time that he instituted the Lord's Supper with him. And that Lord's Supper now looks back to what he did for us on the cross 1,900 years ago. The Passover looked forward to his coming. But the Passover will be restored for the millennial kingdom. We're going to see that, especially in Ezekiel. And the reason, I think, for it is that it will in turn look back at that time to his coming as it had looked forward to his coming. I see no reason why if it couldn't look forward, it could also look backward. And that would bring out during the millennial kingdom the real meaning of the Passover, by the way. And Paul said, Christ our Passover is offered for us. And when we come to verse 26, we find Peter here pledges his allegiance. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it's written, I'll smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this day Even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I'll not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all, by the way, not only Simon Peter, but the others. And we find here first that Simon Peter pledges his allegiance. And he was sincere, but he did not know, of course, his own weakness. That is the problem with most of us, that we do not know our own weakness today. And I personally believe that you don't find out about this in psychology. I think the only place that you can really see yourself is in the Word of God. That's the only mirror we have. I want to say that And I want to read here just a little excerpt of what is being put out today. This is put out by a Christian organization, and it gives, I think, the wrong impression. It talks about the girl that had this problem, and she went to her pastor, and now I'm reading. 
after several talks together, the pastor realized he was not equipped to help her as much as she could be helped. He referred Betty to a competent Christian psychologist, one who, as a professional counselor, led Betty into a deeper understanding of the sources of her anxiety, many of them stemming from childhood experiences long since forgotten but recalled and understood under the guidance of a skilled helper. The result? A Christian teen released from the grip of emotional problems and given a new relationship with herself, others, and the Lord. May I say, that type of a thing reads like Grimm's fairy story, they lived happily ever after. My friend, may I say to you, none of us know the depths of the human heart and only the Word of God can let us see what a sinner we really are. And that was the problem here with Betty, by the way. And that's the problem with Vernon. And that's the problem with you. And I do not know who her pastor was, but I think he could have helped her had he known the Word of God. Let's be very clear. The only solution to a problem is the Lord. You don't solve the problem and then be able to go to the Lord. You go to the Lord, and He is the chief and the great physician. And by the way, a very good psychologist. And He today can help us. He alone knows us. And He is the only one in the final analysis. I am rather insistent in saying this, as you can see, because I think it's important today that somebody say it. We are finding that a great many that are making merchandise of the ills of folk that actually only the Word of God can solve, and only God himself. We'd only learn to go to him and cast ourselves upon him and recognize that we've got bad childhood. We've got bad everything, friends, but he's a savior for us, and we can go to him. How wonderful it is to have someone to go with. Well, now notice here that we find that the Lord Jesus now tells them that he's going before into Galilee. He announces his resurrection. He said, the sheep are going to be scattered, but I'm going on into Galilee after my resurrection. I'll meet you there. And Simon Peter couldn't let it go. He said, though they be offended, I won't be offended. And you just didn't know. Here again, what he's saying. And our Lord prepares him for what's coming but he lets him know that he is going to stand by him, and the Lord will stand by you in these cases that come to us like this. Even in the time of our most desperate and dastardly hour, and it certainly was that for this man. Now we find when we come to verse 32, they now arrive at Gethsemane. And let me read verse 32 here. Our Lord prays there. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane. He saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now we have here them coming to a very familiar place, whether it's the Garden of Gethsemane as it's known today. I do not know. I'm of the opinion that it should be on the other side of the mountain. I think that that is really immaterial. And we find this is the place Judas knew because it was a place that they apparently came to. Our Lord never spent a night inside the city of Jerusalem. He always went out to this place. And you'll notice that we have here, he takes with him again Peter, James, and John. He lost one man, Judas. Now there are eight disciples out on the outside. He takes the three with him, and they brought a step closer to him in this hour, and he went to pray. And the language indicates, I think he faced a sore ordeal in the Garden of Gethsemane. Will you notice it says here, and he began to be sore amazed. Well, that word that's translated here by amazed is startled. And it also is a word here that means stunned. And when it says that he was very heavy, he was distressed. And now notice verse 34. 
And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now this was the travail of soul that was as great, if not greater, than actually the suffering of the body on the cross. The question arises, did he face the tempter again in the garden? I think he did. You read what we had to say in our book on Matthew, moving through Matthew. I must be very frank and say, though, I can only stand here on the fringe. There are mysteries of the garden I do not understand. And I consider it really audacious today. It would even be blasphemous if the folk really knew what they were singing when they say, I'll go with him through the garden. I'm sorry, friend, if you don't mind, if I beg off, I can't go with him through the garden. You don't know how weak I am. <laughs> you don't know how stumbling and bumbling I really am, and therefore I can't go with him through the garden, but I'm going to stand at the edge and watch and pray, because that's what he said to do, that you enter not into temptation. Now will you notice he went forward a little, fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And you notice Mark says that it was the hour which might pass from it. It was not death, really, he dreaded, but rather the hour of the cross. It was that moment when sin was put on him and he was made sin for us. That was the awful thing, and that was what he went through. And the hour and the cup, here he makes synonymous. And we're told, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 5, 7, and 8, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, the three disciples that were there, the three apostles, he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou, couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And the three here were not alarmed. They could sleep through it all. And this man, Peter, wasn't even disturbed that he was going to deny Christ. He just went right off to sleep. He should have been watching and praying, and that was the way to avoid temptation, and it is for us today. Now you'll notice he goes back and he prays the first prayer, and they went to sleep again, and they had no explanation for their failure. You see, the flesh cannot be trusted. And then there apparently was a lapse of time here because they must have had a brief sleep before he was arrested. And we find in verse 41, And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It's enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then there was a lapse of time. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude of swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now see, they have come out to do the thing that they said they would not do, not during the feast days. Now this is the basis act of treachery ever recorded. It's foul and loathsome. Judas knew our Lord's accustomed place here of retirement and he led the enemy there. Now notice verse 44. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away. Well, a kiss is a badge of love and affection, and Judas used it to betray Christ. And I think this makes his act actually more dastardly and repugnant. And it's also well to observe that our Lord in his humanity was not actually different from other men as you observe him and look at him. He needed to be identified in a crowd here. And now we notice in verse 45, and as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And you'll notice he called him Master. No one can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Spirit, Paul says. And now we're told, verse 46, and they laid their hands 
on him and took him. Now this marks the moment that Jesus was delivered into the hands of sinful man. He yields himself now to go to the cross. Now we find that Simon Peter attempts to come to his rescue. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And that was the scripture that needed to be fulfilled. By the way, if you'll notice that Simon Peter's the one here that really cut off his ear. We're told that over in John, the 18th chapter, and it even told the servant's name, and Luke was Malchus, and Simon Peter was a good fisherman, but a pretty sorry swordsman. He got an ear. He intended to get the neck, by the way. He missed it, and they all forsook him. That's a fulfillment of prophecy now. And then we have this incident that a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young man laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. There's always speculation who he is. Some think that he was probably, well, he was Paul the Apostle. And then some think it's John Mark. I personally think that if we have to make a choice, be more apt to be John Mark. Now we're told here, that they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and elders. And when we get over to Luke and John, I want to take up this trial of Jesus in detail. The thing here that I would like to emphasize at this particular section of it, because it's so startling here, and when they brought him in, they brought him, you know, before the Sanhedrin, and they did it at night, And we're told here, verse 60, And the high priest stood by in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? Now, when they brought the lies against him, he didn't even attempt to answer it. They were amazed at that. We're told, but he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? That is, are you the Christ, the Messiah? the Son of God. And Jesus said, I am. Now, don't tell me Jesus didn't teach his deity, friends. Under oath here, he certainly claimed to be God. And not only that, he said, ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, I tell you, the high priest understood what he said. The high priest ran his clothes and saith, what need we any further witness? And by the way, there's a law which we're going to see when we return back to the Old Testament, that said the high priest was never to tear or rend his garment. You've heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Well, either he was accurate or he was not accurate, friends. And if he's not accurate, well, they had some ground for it. But if he's accurate, then they should have done a little more investigating of it. Now this chapter closes on the note of the denial of Simon Peter. The thing our Lord said he would do that night, a little wisp of a maid there caused him to deny the Lord Jesus. And we're told in verse 71, when this maid came after him the second time, he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now notice this, and when he thought thereon, he wept. (laughs) This man could repent of his sin. That's the real test, by the way. And these were tears of genuine repentance. Remember, it was Peter who wrote in 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. He knew the Lord had kept it. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Is it possible for the greatest tragedy of all time to also be the greatest victory in heaven and on earth? 
We'll find out next time as we continue our study in the amazing gospel of Mark. Until then, go deeper in your study of God's word by visiting ttb.org for some great resources or call 1-800-65-BIBLE to invest in the progress of the Bible bus as it rolls along in more than 130 languages worldwide. Jesus made it Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?